Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Patrick Madden, the Executive Director of the National Archives Foundation. And on behalf of the National Archives and the Foundation, happy 4th of July. What a day. Thank you for spending part of your holiday with us. We've got a national audience with us. It's the National Archives. I wouldn't expect anything less, and you couldn't pick a better day to spend with the National Archives. We've heard from some very important people President Jefferson and Mrs. Adams, and shortly we'll hear from John Dunlap. And we've got education programs running all the way until 4 p.m. today, when we will have the official archives ceremony and reading of the Declaration of Independence. So we hope you'll stay with us all afternoon. It is a special day, you won't wanna miss it. Now, each of our guests have agreed to take questions. And so how we're gonna do that is if you can use the chat function, in your YouTube uh, viewing screen. And right now, if you'd like to take a, take a whirl and let us know where you're coming from, where you're viewing from, we'd love to know. I'll give you a shout out a little bit later in the program. So that's where your questions, you can uh, present them while he's talking or towards the end. And we'll do our best to get through as many as we can. Fast fact, do you know the name of the person whose job it was to handwrite the official declaration? Timothy Matlack. It was his job to engross the declaration, the original, which is a fancy word for they used for making legal documents, final and presentable. So the original declaration, the one and only that is signed by all the signers at the National Archives was engrossed by Timothy Matlack. Remember that for your next dinner party. All right, now it's time for our special guest. Allow me to introduce a man who was in Philadelphia when the declaration was being debated and finalized. He was a printer in the city. I'm not gonna spoil it, but he had a little bit to do with helping everybody understand what the Continental Congress decided. Mr. John Dunlap, happy 4th of July. How are you, sir? Oh, I'm quite well, thank you very much. Uh, good day to you, good day to everyone there that's watching. Uh, as mentioned, I'm John Dunlap, and I am the first printer of the Declaration of Independence. So I didn't have a hand in writing it other than correcting spelling here and there. But uh, without me, well, no one really know a whole lot about it, would they? Uh, now, the astute among you will have already picked up on the fact that I'm not from around these parts. I was born in Strabane, County Tyrone, Ulster Province, Ireland. So how is it that some Irish emigrant ended up printing the most important document in American history? Well, to understand how I came to be here, it's necessary to know just a wee bit of my family history. First, despite the fact that I was born in Ireland, Dunlap is not an Irish name. All four of my grandparents were born in Scotland. Now, about 50 years before I made my debut upon this earth, there was an attempt to anglicize the Church of Scotland. That is to say, there was an attempt to make the Church of Scotland more like the Church of England. The Church of Scotland is Presbyterian. The Church of England is Episcopal. A Presbyterian governance is a democracy, and an Episcopal governance is hierarchical, and in this case has the king at the top. Well, there's two things you can say about Presbyterians. It's that we love freedom, and we can't clap on the beat, so we don't try. Thus, my grandsires came to the north of Ireland to escape religious persecution. And so I and my siblings were the second generation of Dunlaps to be born in Ireland. Now, there are three classes of people in the north of Ireland there. You've got your Papists, or Catholics as they're commonly called, Churchmen, or Anglicans, and Presbyterians. So we're sort of in the middle of the midden, if you take my meaning. Anyway, as a young boy, I never given much thought to leaving. While it's true that jobs are scarce there, unless you want to end up working on a flax plantation, my dad had got me an apprenticeship at a print shop. So I thought the course of my life was set. When it's 10 years old, though, that all changed. You see, 10 years old, that's when they start taking young boys for the Royal Navy. Now, at the time, they couldn't take Catholics. That actually changed with our little war here, the American Revolution. Yeah, the British needed to allow Catholics to serve because they couldn't get enough recruits otherwise. But when I was a boy, Catholics were barred from military service. So Catholics are out. Now, if you were the son of an Anglican, the chances are your father had enough status to be able to keep you out of the clutches of the recruiting parties. But if you were a young Presbyterian lad like me and my brother Robert, well, we were fair pickings. So our parents made the difficult decision 
to send us away forever. Fortunately, we were not the first Dunlaps to come to the New World. My father's older brother, William, had come to Pennsylvania many years before. He was, at that time, living in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, which people there say Lancaster, but it's Lancaster. So we sailed into Philadelphia and then took a long wagon ride to our new home. Uncle William had a print shop, and since I had already started in that vocation, I became his apprentice. After about a year in the country, the whole family relocated to Philadelphia. And normally, when you apprentice, you apprentice for a certain term, and it depends on what you're doing, what the profession is. Makes sense. Some professions take longer to learn is all. Here's the range. Doctor, five years. Lace maker, 14 years. Tells you a little something about doctors, doesn't it? Guess that's why they call it a medical practice. You don't quite have it all figured out by the time you start. For many vocations, about seven to nine years is fairly standard. So you start as an apprentice, and then once you've completed your apprenticeship, you become a journeyman. A journeyman, as the name implies, may travel to another master's shop, but he still works for someone. Of course, the goal, or most people's goal, is to eventually work one's way up to being a master. But the difference between master and journeyman is less in skill and more in capital. If you're a master blacksmith, you have to own a forge and have all the tools, for example. I, however, went straight from apprentice to master, skipping the journeyman step altogether. The reason for this is I had a nine-year apprenticeship, but when I was 19 years old, my uncle found the Lord. Actually, I guess it'd be better to say the Lord found me uncle. He'd become a minister. He went over to England to be ordained and then ended up being called to a parish down in Virginia. So suddenly, I was a master of my own print shop, but I didn't actually own it. You see, my uncle still owned the buildings and the press. It took me almost five years to pay him off. So while I ran the shop, I put every penny of profit into paying down the debt that I owed to my uncle. I even slept on a mattress under the counter in the shop and lived on nothing but pepper pot stew and bread bought out at the market right outside my door. There were only two luxuries that I allowed myself. And as you'll soon see, there was a purpose behind these allowances. I was a member of two exclusive gentlemen's clubs, the Gloucester County Fox Hunting Association and the State in Schuylkill, which back then was called the Colony in Schuylkill, an exclusive fishing club. I joined these clubs because despite the expense, and they were expensive, in addition to the subscription fee, there were uniforms for each club, equipment, incidentals, whiskey. But these clubs also counted among their members some of the most important men in Philadelphia. I couldn't tell you exactly how many printers there were in Philadelphia when I took over the business, but by the end of the century, there were over 50. A man who wants to do business needs to distinguish himself in that crowd. Hobnobbing with the elite of the city was one way to make that happen. It's always who you know, isn't it? So, as I was saying, other than those two clubs, which were really business expenses, if you think about it, I didn't spend money on anything other than food and clothes until I paid off my debt. One of the reasons for that is um, I met this girl. Well, not a, a, a woman, of course, not a girl. But anyway, I wanted to marry her, but I didn't want to get married in debt because all the fellas will tell you that's a tough sell there. So I got the final payment together in December of 1772. I paid my uncle in January of 73, and Elizabeth and I were married in February. So by 1773, I'd come a long way from the 10-year-old emigrant boy who had first set foot on the streets of Philadelphia. I had a new wife, a successful business, and wealthy, influential friends. Though I started out printing sermons, handbills, and pamphlets, by 1771, I was publishing one of Philadelphia's four weekly newspapers, the Pennsylvania Packet and General Advertiser. Well, things were going well for me. The American colonies were not sharing in my good fortune. There's a great deal of political unrest, mostly due to the issue of taxation. There had even been riots over taxes like the Stamp Act. By 1773, they'd all been repealed. Well, except for the tea tax, you know. Of course, the Sons of Liberty weren't going to take that one lying down. And so in December, the Boston Tea Party occurred. This led to the Port of Boston being closed, Parliament passing a series of acts concerning a uh, trial of government officials, the quartering of troops, and so on. These troubles with the mother country led to the meeting of the First Continental Congress at Carpenter's Hall in Philadelphia. Being a staunch patriot, I had hoped to be named the official printer to the Congress because, of course, I supported the American cause against the British. 
And also, you know, government contracts tend to be somewhat lucrative. Unfortunately, I was passed over at that time. Yet, I still wanted to do me part, for it felt as though something momentous was about to occur. No sooner had Congress vacated Carpenter's Hall than myself and 27 other like-minded men of the community formed the Philadelphia Light Horse for the defense of the city and the surrounding countryside. I was elected to the rank of Cornet, which is the lowest rank of officer in the cavalry. Of course, then in April, shots were fired up in Massachusetts and the war began. A second Continental Congress came together in Philadelphia and they named George Washington as general and they put him in charge of that whole mess. Since we were some of the only soldiers what were formed up already, and we were mounted, of course, we actually escorted His Excellency General Washington from Philadelphia on the first leg of his journey up towards Cambridge, Massachusetts, where he was sworn in as Commander-in-Chief. It was also around this time that my wife introduced me to her great uncle, who had lately returned from more than a decade in England. We ended up getting along quite well, it turns out he even had some experience in the printing trade. His name was Benjamin Franklin. So there it was, 1775. I'm a well-established printer in the city of Philadelphia. I'm known by the city's finest gentlemen. I'm an officer in an elite company of militia. And my uncle by marriage is Benjamin Franklin. It would seem only natural to make me the official printer of the Congress. But they didn't. They gave the post to Robert Aiken. No matter. Surely there must be a way to serve my country and turn a profit. Of course. With a war going on, people need information. Everyone wants to know the latest progress reports of battles, reports of casualties. So he started a second newspaper. Dunlap's Maryland Gazette or the Baltimore General Advertiser. And then awaited for stories of heroism and misery to unfold. Nothing happened. Not nothing, but almost nothing. After the Battle of Bunker Hill, the British held up in Boston and Washington and his Continental Army laid siege by the hilltop surrounding or from the hilltop surrounding. Have you ever been to a sporting match where the ball just goes back and forth and no one scores? That's how exciting it was. Now, as a Christian, I'm happy that the siege resulted in little loss of life. But as a newspaper man, I can tell you, sieges don't sell papers. The British didn't leave Boston until the following March of 1776. Though many, including General Washington, believed their next target would be New York. They actually retreated to Halifax, Nova Scotia to re-equip, train, and wait for reinforcements. And none of that makes a good read. However, the Congress was not idle during this time. Despite the fact they had no legal authority to govern, they basically assumed all the functions of a government, and that required a lot of things to be printed. It was too much for just one man or one shop to do, so the Congress started to look for additional printers. And of course, they asked people who were from Philadelphia, and the eldest member of the Pennsylvania delegation just happened to be me great uncle by marriage. See, I told you, it's always who you know. I printed Continental Currency, Proclamations, Broadsides, and on July 4th, 1776, I was asked to print a very special declaration. The Congress actually voted for independency on the 2nd of July, but, well, it's Congress, isn't it? it? Took them two days to argue and decide how they wanted to say that. They finally approved the text of the Declaration of Independence sometime around mid-morning on the 4th, and they sent it to me, wanting to be printed that very day. So I set to work immediately, rushing through what was the most important job of my life. In the printing trade, of course, it's not the actual printing that takes a long time to do. It's the typesetting. That's sort of the whole point to printing. You know, you do enough preparation and you can have as many copies as you like. So while I was still set in type, some of the committee members showed up along with the president of the Congress, John Hancock. Do you have any idea what it's like to set type? With Benjamin Franklin look over one shoulder, John Hancock over the other, and little John Adams getting his hot breath on your elbow? Yeah. Nerve wracking. I don't recall how many I printed in total that first night, perhaps 100 or 120. John Hancock took charge of all the copies. He sent them out to colonial legislatures, military officials, committees of correspondence, and so on. Do you know how it is? You order so many copies of something and you think you have enough, and then you find out you need more. Well, that's exactly what happened with John Hancock. 
The following day, he ordered 50 or 80 more. In between, I made a slight adjustment to the form between printings. Thus, there are what we call two states, the first state being printed on the fourth and the second state being printed on the fifth. The only real difference in the second state is everything moved to the left just slightly. I feel the change was justified. That was a print joke, by the way. I told them I could just do 15 minutes of print jokes. They said no. So that's just a little bit about how the first copy of the Declaration came to be printed and why I was the person printing it. Now, when someone says Declaration of Independence, most people picture the scrivened or the handwritten copy that Timothy Matlack did and that everybody signed. Sure, that's the official copy. But the ones that I printed on the 4th and 5th of July, 1776, are the very first copies. Now, eventually, 56 men would go on to sign the Matlack copy. But those 56 men represent 4 million people living in 13 English colonies along the North Atlantic coast. Without those 4 million people, those 56 men can't fight a war or start a nation. And how do those people find out about independence? My broadsides were spread to every colony where they were read out loud in taverns and on street corners. They were often reprinted in the local newspaper. The news spread like wildfire, and it was my printing that started a continent ablaze. The fact that the Declaration was printed is so important. It's actually in the words of the document itself. We do solemnly publish and declare. Well, Congress may have declared, but I published. They say that knowledge is power. If that's true, then publishing is how you give that power to the people. And that is how an Irish immigrant ended up printing the most important document in American history. Wonderful. Thank you, Mr. Dunlop. That was wonderful. Uh, of course. Um, do, do you have any time for some questions? Oh, I'd love to answer a few questions. Excellent. So I want to remind our viewers that uh, if you go to the chat in YouTube, you can send your questions through there. And um, we have people from all over the country, Waukee, Iowa, Atlanta, South Carolina, North Carolina, Colorado, San Diego, San Francisco, Texas, Seattle, Richfield, and Hawaii. We have uh, our very large and beautiful country represented today. Some of those you might be less familiar with. I don't really uh, think others. I've heard of any of those, yeah. <laughs> very good. Well, um, let's start with the basics. What kind of ink and paper did you use um, for the printing? So uh, it's an excellent question. So we're using uh, India ink. And uh, the paper, however, that I used for this, well, remember, it was sort of a rush job. So it doesn't all match. But almost all of it is imported Dutch paper. Uh, Dutch paper was the most commonly used paper for um, any legal document or anything. It was sort of the highest quality paper that we had imported here in America. Uh, but you can check because most of them are watermarked. And so if you t look at two uh, copies of my declaration, you'll find that they may be on uh, paper from a different manufacturer. Now, when I was printing uh, my newspapers and things of that nature, I actually made my own paper and it was linen rag paper. So I would actually go around and collect old linens, old uh, you know, tablecloths, sheets, uh, clothing, and pulp it and make me own linen paper. But for this document, I thought we needed something a little bit more special. And so it is actually printed on the good stuff. Very good. Well, there's been a question about newspapers. You just mentioned, do you know what the first newspaper was in the colonies or some of the newspapers maybe in, you might be more familiar in, in Philadelphia or in some of the big cities during your time? So uh, William Bradford, who actually was the, um, the first, let me back up. The first printing press in Philadelphia was uh, owned by a man by the name of William Bradford. And uh, the Quakers sort of rode him out of town more or less. And he ended up going, taking his press and going to New York. But he sent, after he had established a business there, he sent his um, brother, I guess it was, back to Philadelphia to, uh, to, to start a pro, sort of satellite print trade here in Philadelphia. Um, now, he didn't print a paper, but his, I guess it would be his grandson did. Uh, and that's, if that, I think that's the first one in Philadelphia, though I'm not 100% sure. That was all before I got here. The, um, William, the William Bradford, the grandson, is actually the one that my uncle William apprenticed with. 
So there's sort of this tradition. But if you want to know about the first weekly paper, or rather the first daily paper, I should say, weekly papers were very common. Like I said, when I started, there were four in Philadelphia, but the first daily paper was mine. Hmm. Interesting. Well, you mentioned that uh, you've maybe fixed some grammar or some typos, but did you make any mistakes? We've had a couple of questions about inalienable rights and unalienable rights. Right. So uh, Mr. Jefferson, and I mean no disrespect to him, but he wrote inalienable. I'm pretty sure that's not a word. So I wrote, uh, I I changed it to unalienable. That's the most uh, sort of no pun intended graphic change that I made to the document. Uh, The other thing that you'll notice is uh, there's a couple other things that you'll notice. Again, it was a rush uh, job. I was trying to get it done. They wanted it done. Yeah, I had the founding fathers breathing down my neck when it happened. So what you'll find is the space in between words is not uniform. Now, that's not uncommon in an 18th century document because we don't, sometimes if we want to emphasize a word, we can do a couple of things. We can put it all in uh, small capital letters, but we can also set it apart from other words by having a larger space, even if it's within a sentence, having a larger space on either side of it. However, those spaces are exaggerated in the printing of the declaration. And the reason for that is if I made a mistake, rather than go back and correct the whole line, I would just move letters around. And just if I had to take out letters, I would just take, I would just add extra space between words as opposed to redoing the entire line because I was trying to get it out as fast as possible. And the other thing, and this is, this is embarrassing, but I'll admit it to you because we're all friends here, aren't we? there's not a single printing of the declaration in either the first state or the second state that is perfectly straight on the paper. We will have to look more closely at these copies then. Um, You've mentioned uh, obviously the attention to detail. Would you recommend the the printing trade to folks during your time? Did you have apprentices? Oh, I did. Uh, You know, that was the best way to get, free labor, really. Um, And that way you sent, you know, normally what would happen is an apprentice wouldn't necessarily go directly into competition with you if he was coming from Philadelphia, because printing was expanding all the time. And so he might do it for, that's what my uncle did. He didn't start out printing in Philadelphia. He went to Lancaster to start his first print shop because he wanted to go someplace where they didn't have a lot of printers and he didn't have a lot of competition. Um, so th- that was the best way to, to get sort of that way that you could get help around the shop. Uh, and then you just, you traded somebody, you trained somebody up and you knew that eventually they were going to go out and hopefully make you proud doing, doing good work, but not in the same town as you. Very good. Um, how much were you paid to print the declaration? That's an excellent question. I didn't keep track. However, uh, the documents that I printed in 1776, uh, which there were there were several, but I think I was paid uh, in the order of six hundred and fifty some dollars for all the documents that year. So that's a sizable amount to be paid, uh, and I did I did do a fair bit of printing for them. So the Declaration of Independence is within that figure, but I did I don't have it separated out by how much I got paid for that particular printing. Hmm. And did you did you have children, and did they go into the printmaking? Uh, field? I I did have children. Um, uh, So mostly daughters, however. So they did not go into the print trade. Um, And uh, me, uh, I I ended up uh, with, um, you know, as far as uh, one son and uh, nephews and things of that nature, I actually, they ended up being uh, frontiersmen, some of them, as the West expanded. And um, because I actually ended up owning quite a bit of land in what becomes Kentucky because I bought up land after the war. Interesting uh, segue because someone asked what happened after the war? Did you continue printing in Philadelphia or did you, perhaps you might've moved? My goal was always to try to retire around the age of 45, um, which is average life expectancy in the middle colonies at that time for adults. So you know, I figured if I got there, anything after that was gravy, as they say. So uh, I think I re- ended up retiring a few years after that, 48 or so. But uh, what I ended up doing is speculating in land. And I, but there was a lot of land that could be bought up uh, inexpensively after the war. And if you could afford to sit on it for a while, you could make a bit of a profit there. So I bought, as I said, a lot of sort of land sight unseen 
in Kentucky. And I actually bought quite a bit of property in Philadelphia as well. As a matter of fact, I ended up opening all the property between Market Street and Chestnut Street and between 11th Street and 12th Street, which is an empire in a city like Philadelphia. Wow. Very good. Um, I have a question about uh, the printing. So obviously you were, you were testing it, you were typesetting it. When it was all said and done, did you keep a copy for yourself? No, I wish I had. I wish I'd kept one for myself and for each of uh, each of my uh, children because, you know, they could have kept it for a while. But it's one of those things where you don't know how much something will be worth until somebody in the future puts a price on it. Um, I did uh, have to give a copy to, uh, well, we, you mentioned Timothy Matlack, I know, uh, and I mentioned him as well. He's the 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 Scrivener, the fellow that did the actual uh, official copy. Well, he didn't read that from Thomas Jefferson's notes. He read that off of one of my copies. Hmm. Okay. Did the, um, we have a question about the, uh, the British treatment. Uh, did the British, the, their treatment of the Irish affect you in any way before you supported the American cause? Well, so you have to remember that I'm in this sort of strange in-between group in the north of Ireland. You've got the Catholics, which are the sort of native population, and you've got Anglicans, um, a lot of which came over from Scotland or England, and they had set up, this goes all the way back to the reign of Elizabeth, I think, um, they set up the plantation system in the north of Ireland where they'd have somebody come over basically to be the, it's not dissimilar from what's been done on plantations in America, where you had somebody coming over and overseeing a a large underpaid labor force. Um, And so that led to a lot of economic animosity between Catholics and Anglicans and Presbyterians. We sort of got caught in the middle in a way that it depended on, we could get lumped with the Catholics for one thing and lumped with the Anglicans for another thing. So we, so it was a difficult time, but I think we, but I think we escaped the worst of the persecution that you could have there. Mm -hmm. Um, As a newspaper man, um, how did you gather news where we have reporters, we have people who publish newspapers and then we have people that go and find the news or investigate it. Uh, Tell us about, uh, the newspaper business in your day? So a lot of it was done. There were people who would, who'd tell me things that had happened and I would go, if it was something important, like for example, there's a big fire. I might go and actually speak to somebody who was there to get a firsthand account. However, quite frankly, people wanted to see their name in print. So they would come and just give information most of the times. And if it was somebody who was, you know, quite poor, I could give them, next to nothing for that information. They often didn't even care about being paid for it. Uh, The other thing is uh, you would buy, if you're a newspaper man, you make sure that you buy newspapers from other cities. So there was somebody who had come down with newspapers from a newspaper from Trenton or a newspaper from New York or something like that. That's one way that information was spread throughout the colonies. Uh, I mentioned, well, the Declaration of Independence is a great example. So let's say I made 200 copies however many it was, I don't recall, but they go out to all the important people, but how does the common person hear about it? Well, sometimes they were read out loud, as I said, but also I printed, so July 8th, 1776, I printed maybe 600 copies of the Declaration of Independence in my own newspaper. And the following day on the 9th, I printed it in the Maryland Gazette. And then what would happen is somebody from Delaware would get a hold of Maryland Gazette and would see that and would set the, his type in his newspaper from that. And it was sort of almost leapfrog its way down uh, the colonies. And that's how information was spread. So a lot of times we were sort of um, plagiarizing each other in a way where we would just take news from a paper that we had read and that's how information would spread out. And it can go quite rapidly. You can have a story in, in Philadelphia, uh, you know, and, less than two months later, it might be being printed someplace in Georgia. That may not seem quick to you, but to us, that's, that's pretty miraculous. So that's very interesting because, um, so you are famously known for pr- the first printing of the declaration. So did you circulate your printing so other newspapers around the colonies would print it? Or how did they, how did the word spread and did those other newspapers, I'm, I'm not aware of the, uh, Charleston 
Gazette's printer's name and if he printed some in, in, in South Carolina. So uh, t- tell us a little bit did, with the declaration specifically. Well, so a couple of ways that that could have been done is it could have the, the, that sort of leapfrogging of newspapers. But with the, with the declaration, the more likely thing is that that person in Charlestown got a hold of the actual one of my actual copies that were sent to um, a member of the legislature there or a military official or a, a member of the committee of correspondence who said, you should print this in your paper because this is news every American needs to know. Okay. And um, speaking of these newspapers, so we, um, we have a, a phenomenon now where s- sometimes the, the facts aren't always true. And I've heard uh, both from Mr. Adams and Mr. Jefferson during their, their uh, battle for the White House that there were some pretty nasty things said in the media, especially in newspapers uh, about each other. Uh, so if you, if you got some of the facts wrong, did you correct them? Or were newspapers known to be aligned with either certain politicians or certain views? It depends generally what is most expedient and most profitable uh, as to whether or not you print a retraction. Newspapers are absolutely aligned with politicians or causes. Um, As a matter of fact, uh, a competitor, well, this is after I, I I only had the Maryland newspaper for uh, a little over three years, but um, one of the newspapers that sprung up to, after I had sold that concern, one of the newspapers that sprung up in um, a competition with that particular paper was the Baltimore Whig Review, I think it was called. So that's, that's a political newspaper uh, that is telling things from the perspective of the, the American Whig Party. Mm-hmm. And were you afraid of committing uh, treason by printing the declaration? Well, there comes a time in life, I think, that you have to throw your lot in with something. You have to remember, by, the, by that point, I had been in, for about a year and a half, I had already been in a militia force that was there to defend Philadelphia against the British. So I had already thrown my hat into that ring, so to speak. And so I feel like, uh, you know, a man has to stand behind what he believes, number one. And, you know, with some of these things, you're also taking a gamble. If it's something you believe in, and you could profit by it, then, you know, I wanted everyone to know that that declaration was printed by John Dunlap. When it made it down to Georgia, I wanted it to say, printed, Philadelphia printed by John Dunlap, so that people knew where it came from. And yes, there was a danger in doing that, but there would have been a danger, I think, for me, regardless. Very good. Well, we've come to the end of our time. This has been really wonderful. Um, and uh, to, to use a printer saying, you've made an impression on generations. Oh, that's a good one. I'm putting that in my 15-minute print joke routine. There you go. Thank you for your time today. Now we're going to turn to the National Archives in New York City. Sarah Lyons Davis uh, has a fun activity for everyone. Sarah? Thank you, Patrick. You just heard from Mr. John Dunlap, the official printer of the Continental Congress. Mr. Dunlap's work was to create copies of official documents so they could be recorded. He also made copies of documents for the public. So when the declaration was approved and adopted, Dunlap got to work making the first copy, in the form of a broadside, for Congress to enter in the Journal of the Continental Congress's July 4th entry. Dunlap then made copies of the declaration that would be sent out and read to the public. Broadsides were like the newspaper of the day. They were sheets of paper that you could print. There were many broadsides printed for spreading news and many printers in 1776. But since John Dunlap was the official printer for Congress, his broadside is referred to as the Dunlap broadside. News about the Declaration of Independence was so significant for the colonists to know about. So Dunlap printed around 200 copies. Those copies were sent throughout the colonies and read in cities and towns so everyone would know Congress planned to break away from British rule. Remember, in 1776, there were no phones, televisions, or computers to share information. So broadsides were commonly used to spread news. The average broadside was not just read to the public, but posted in public spaces for all to read. Imagine what it would be like to go into your town and look at the outside of a building to read your news. 
The average broadside was about 20 inches high and 16 inches wide, roughly the size of a small poster today. The National Archives holds the official copy of the Dunlap broadside, the one that was entered into the Journal of Congress back on July 4, 1776. Our version is one of 26 copies known to currently exist. So now that you know what a broadside is, and what the Dunlap broadside signifies, let's take a closer look at the Dunlap broadside and compare it to the written version of the Declaration. The original draft of the Declaration was also officially copied onto parchment and signed. That is known as the engrossed copy of the Declaration of Independence, and the one on display in the rotunda of the National Archives in Washington, D.C., its permanent home. Okay, let's compare. You can see the Dunlap broadside is slightly smaller than the written declaration. Note the header. It tells us what this document is and what day it was finalized. Where are all the signatures? That's right, this is a printed document, so a full listing of the signers of the declaration are not listed in the broadside. Remember, the broadside was printed to share the words of the declaration. The words are what was important for the colonists to hear. Not only are there no signatures, but there are also only two names listed on the document, that of John Hancock, President of the Continental Congress, and Charles Thompson, the Secretary. The Dunlap broadside isn't the only copy of the Declaration. It is the printed copy of the words. There is another copy of the Declaration, one that was taken from the original engrossed Declaration. That is known as the stone engraving was created in 1823. Just 40 years after the Declaration was drafted, it started to fade. In 1820, in order to preserve the look of the original, Secretary of State John Quincy Adams asked William J. Stone, a Washington, D.C. printer and engraver, to make a copper engraving reproducing the size, text, lettering, and signatures of the original. A copper plate was made and the Declaration and copies of the document printed of the original. So, the National Archives has the original declaration, the printed broadside version known as the Dunlap broadside, and then the stone engraving, which is the realistic copy. So this is often the version you see for sale in gift shops and displayed. So that brings us to our craft activity. If you had a message to share with someone or a group of people, how would you share it? What would your message be? Consider what resources you have. You can use technology, but Let's try and be creative using things you may have around your house. You can use a magazine, a newspaper, a piece of paper, pen, markers, pencils, or even a stamp kit. Now, create your own broadside using any or all of these materials. If you have stamps, you can use words, letters, or images to draft a message. So this message was created using a stamp kit that we had around the house. There are other options too. You can also cut out words and pictures to create a broadside. You can see that I did this from part of a magazine. You can also make a very simple version too, and a simple message with pen or markers on a piece of paper, and then write your name. As we spoke about earlier, John Hancock was one of only two names listed on the broadside. So his wife Dorothy will be featured in the next hour's programming. He was a respected patriot and unanimously elected as president of the Second Continental Congress. Hancock was the first to sign the engrossed version of the Declaration. This is the broadside, as I said, so his signature on the engrossed was large and ornate. Because of this, his name has become synonymous with putting one signature on a document. So remember though, on this version, our broadside, his name was printed. And you can see that on the bottom. So on your version, you can write your name instead of adding your signature. And remember, choose whatever message you want for your broadside. You can write, we love the National Archives, happy 4th of July, and then hang it on the wall behind you. So 
So here's my finished broadside in honor of the 4th of July. Remember, share what you create with us. You can tweet us using the hashtag ArchivesJuly4. Thanks, Sarah. That was fantastic. You can add your signature to the declaration. If you go to archivesjuly4.org, we have an electronic declaration where you can add your name. Give it a try. Well, as we wrap up, uh, you might have noticed my quick change into some more patriotic gear. If you like this shirt, it's only in the 90s in Washington, D.C. today. We do have it in a short sleeve as well. Uh, go to the archive store where we have, if you do want your own declaration, we have many sizes and shapes, or maybe a patriotic hat, red, white, and blue, available also at archivesfoundation.org. And today, if you haven't heard already in one of the other sessions, 50% off all day today on the site. Uh, you can use the code LIBERTY50, that's the word LIBERTY and the number 50, uh, to get your discount. So get over to our store, check it out. And while you're at our website, take a look at the other programs and things that we do throughout the year to support the National Archives outreach in DC and across the country. Before we go, we want to thank our sponsors, John Hancock and AARP. Without their support, July 4th at the National Archives would not be possible today. And of course, our members who support us throughout the year. Thank you. I hope you'll tune in shortly. Uh, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, we've got Dorothy Hancock. And of course, She's fairly famous. She has a fairly famous husband, but she played her own role during the revolutionary time. On behalf of the National Archives and the National Archives Foundation, thank you for spending part of your holiday with us. While you're waiting for the next program, don't forget to hit us up on social media. Use the hashtag ArchivesJuly4. We want to see what you're doing on this holiday. Until we see you again, wave your flag, enjoy your patriotic day, and happy July 4th.